Good morning. Good morning. It, is, it is always so good to be back with you here. You know, I said this just a little bit ago. The Spirit is so strong here. It, it is such a beautiful thing. And again, I'm humbled. This is such a morning of joy. You've called and found a new pastor. And I stand here where Gary stood for so long. <laughs> You guys hit my heart every time. Uh, and to be a little bit of stopgap for you in his parting and a new coming is such a privilege. Uh, the call of a pastor to a church is its of a paramount of importance, but so deeply important to God's kingdom and the glory of his kingdom. So what a blessing to be here with you in the announcement this morning of a new pastor being called here. I can't tell you how wonderful it is. And then you guys always surprise me. I don't know who picked the music this morning. Sue, did you have anything to do with that? Okay. Uh, the reason I say that, because you're pulling on my heartstrings in overtime this morning, I can only imagine is a song that speaks into my heart. And as you get older, my wife and I have these conversations. You know, what, what do you, you want to do when your funeral time comes? I have, I have my wish list. Which, which I, uh, to go back briefly, uh, you know, you know I had that heart event on February 12th, and I have this vision someday when God calls me home that I'm going to be surrounded by my family and my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I've, I've got a picture in my own mind of how I want it to be. Of course, I have no control over anything as I found on October 12th. But when we do have time to talk about what our wishes are, what our favorite scriptures are, what our favorite hymns, I can only imagine is one of mine. Because when I hear that song, I can only imagine. And it, it touches me to my core. So thanks for that, because the tears were rolling down the side of my face and as, as I'm singing along with that song, I'm thinking, why? But you know, maybe it's because we can only imagine. You know, and that's a good thing because God gave us imagination. Let us open with prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Be with us this morning, Lord, as we examine the life of Paul. Amen. Now, I, I've got to be honest about this. What's happening in my life, because you guys have affected my life, I just want you to know that. And it was the last time I was here, the last two weeks, we were in the book of Philippians, that very large book of four pages. But I had this epiphany as I was preparing it that, well, who was Paul? We know little tidbits about him as we read all of his writings. But all of a sudden, that boyish curiosity of mine that is now coming back in my 70s, I don't know where it went for a while, but not, it's like, you know, little anybody that has had a son or every man in the church, why? Well, that's what I wanted to know about Paul. Why? And so I began the research, and I'm not done, and, and, and I, I plan over the next three weeks that I'll be here with you to look into the life of Paul and, and to see who he was and who he became. And, and I hope, like, I'm reading two books at the same time uh, because every time I turn a page, you go, oh, that's not what I thought. That's not what I imagined. It was Paul, the apostle. Let's read uh, Acts 9, verses 1 through 19, then I'll get into my lesson. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there that belonged to the way, the way meeting followers of Jesus Christ, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on the journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, Lord, Saul, I'm Jesus, who, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now can you imagine just for a minute, now you've got to get into the mind of Saul, God all of a sudden is speaking to him on this road to Damascus suddenly, without any preparation, without any warning. He wasn't in prayer speaking to God. It just, bam, it just happened. And you have to understand the heart of Saul on this journey. He was really angry. He was vengeful. He was a very angry man. 
doesn't sound like the Apostle Paul that we've come to know. And I can imagine Paul saying, if it was modern times, I think you have the wrong number. Who did you want? And who who are you that's calling me? In verse 6, now get up and go into the city. Right away he gets a command, and you will be told what you must do. This is probably the greatest conversion in Scripture, especially when you go back, which we will shortly, to see about Paul's conversion. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. So they heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him, to the, led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Again, I want to try to get into the mind of, of Saul. And, and think about it, and we've all been blind at some point to something where you just can't see what's right in front of you when the answer is there. What was he thinking? Jesus had spoken to him. Why? He's now blinded, being led by others. Why? You have to realize Saul, a young man, is is used to being in charge. We'll get into his history in just a minute. But during this period of blindness... Was he reflecting? Was he looking back? Was he wondering, starting to question himself? In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named Taurus, named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he was seen a man <clears throat> in a vision he was seen a man named Ananias come place his hands on and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered. And I love this because Saul had a reputation. I I have heard from many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority of the priest, uh, the chief priest, to arrest all on all who call you by name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, I love this. See, again, we all have a reputation somewhere to somebody. Saul had a reputation, and it wasn't one that any of us would be particularly proud of. And he had a reputation in the name of God. This man is my chosen instrument to carry out my name before the Gentiles and their kings before the people of Israel. I will show him how much, listen to this now, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. What about joy? Yay! No. How much he will suffer. This sounds like something we're all going to raise our hands for. I want suffering, do you? Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placed his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you might see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales came off his face. And he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. That was a spiritual birth. You might say that he was born again at that moment. Now we're going to look at Saul. Perhaps most of you, like I did, we tend to put people on places that they probably don't belong, that we admire. Let's look at what Paul has given us. He was both of the letters to the Corinthians. He wrote Romans, which Charles Swindoll refers to as the Magna Carta of Christian life. Paul also wrote the letter to the Galatians, encouraging them and us to live and, and with the freedom of God. 
God's grace that he provides for us. He also brought the prison epistles. We find often that Paul is writing these beautiful letters to us while he's incarcerated. Now, I, I've been as a chaplain in jail cells. And, I, and our jail cells are really nice compared to what Paul was probably in. But I, I, it's, it's almost hard for me to imagine even the ones that we have at our police department feeling inspired while sitting there. They're not a place of comfort or warmth. But yet Paul did some of his most beautiful writings while he was incarcerated. His pastoral letters are full of wisdom and they are applicable then as they are today. Based on Paul's resume of all of his writings, you think, wow, what a great guy. He must have had a great family. Must have grew up with great Christian values. Not even close. Not even in the same building. Not only was he not a Christian, but he hated the name of Jesus. Hated the name of Jesus. Now think about it. Jump back. He's, now, he's been blinded. He's now sees. He's full of the Holy Spirit. I, I can only imagine what's going through his mind with this. Tra- it isn't like there was time. It isn't like he was studying scriptures for a long time and, and over a period of time he saw the light. No, he had the light taken away and then it was revealed to him again. He hated Christians. But we must be able to see the absolute darkness that he came from to be able to appreciate his transformation from Saul into Paul. We don't see in this journey the brilliant law student sitting at the feet of Camomile, the elder or or rabbi in Camomile, who was the head Sanhedrin, which was part of the Jewish council of 70 that ruled over the <clears throat> ruled over the, uh, uh, the, the affairs of Judaism. We first see a young Saul being witness to the brutal, brutal murder of Daniel. St- Stephen, I'm sorry. See, I got Daniel in my mind. And in Acts 7, 58, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. He was revered, respected, and admired by his Jewish peers. It's almost unimaginable to think of this young man named Saul who became known as the Apostle of Grace. Murderer, Apostle of Grace. It kind of, compare and contrast, it doesn't fit in the same page. How can it be? Augustine refers to Saul's conversion in these ways. The violent capture of a rebel's will. The violent capture of a rebel's will. Maybe there's a little rebel in all of us at some point in our journey in life. In 1 Timothy verse, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, one day mercy met the rebel Saul as he pressed toward Damascus. Again, as I've said to you many times before, I'm a real visual person. Uh, and when I'm studying scripture, I try to visualize myself being there. Trying to get a sense of the air, the smell, the scenery, the climate. To get to know what, the environment that we're in. Saul grew up with wealth. Was the beneficiary of a rich religious and intellectual heritage. His parents were Pharisees. Jewish nationalists with a strict obedience to the law of Moses. You got to realize, we got to put ourselves in their mindset. They figure they got it right. They are, and they are, God's chosen people. Minus one thing. The biggest one, but minus one thing. But imagine Saul being brought up in that, in that religious upbringing, faithful to the law of Moses, believing in his heart that their way was the right way. And everyone else was very wrong. Friendship with the Gentiles of that time was discouraged. They didn't want to be contaminated by any of the words that they might hear. They might be contaminated by the truth. F- 
friendship with Gentiles, again, was discouraged. John Pollock, the author, this is the other book that I'm reading, The Apostle, A Life of Paul, describes the early life of Saul in these words. They looked to Jerusalem as Islam looks to Mecca. Their privilege as free men of Taurus and Roman citizens were nothing too high of an honor of being Israelites. The people of promise, to whom all alone the living God had revealed his glory. So they believed, and you can almost, as you, as you get behind the scenes in Paul's life, you can almost understand, well, I don't understand the hate part or the vengeance part. That I don't, and I don't know as I'll ever wrap my brain around it. Maybe I'll come across some book at some point that'll explain the need to kill others in your God's name. But that, that was the case. Paul, the apostle, wasn't the man that we knew when he was Saul. We're going to find over the next two weeks, we're going to dig a little deeper into this man. I couldn't do it all this morning because I would be getting looks that I've been going too long and I don't want to do that. And sometimes we can do that. God has put it on my heart to look at the disciples. I will probably spend the next several months, my pastor was just raising his eyebrows at me. We were talking about this. He's got a book that he's got, a book that he's got to dig out for me. Because I'm curious, and I hope you all are curious. We read scripture. We know it's about Jesus. We know it's heading us in one direction. We can only imagine one day what it'll be. All of that's great. But I, at this age, at 76 year old, I got 76 years of age, I have this boyish curiosity to get, well, who and why? Who was Paul? Who were the apostles? So I'm, I'm in the early stages of this. Maybe I'll be back again to share at some point other aspects. I know my church is bracing for the 12 disciples. Uh, it'll take me months and months and months of research and reading to, to find out. But I'm curious about who the men and women were that served our Lord and Savior. Because I want to get a peek at their hearts. When we ac accept Christ into our hearts, then his love abounds through us. You know, back in February 12th, when I had that, my emergency heart surgery that I didn't prepare for, I didn't want, I didn't even know I had a heart condition. Did not know. And like Saul, my life changed like that. Just like that. And things happened in a way that I could not never anticipate. I didn't like it. I didn't want it. I wasn't prepared for it. And our whole life was changed. Too bad, Joe. You know, as I shared with you that day, because I, I, you were my test, my, my test baby, if you will, when I shared my experience that day in, in Isaiah 41, uh, 10 and 11, I believe it is, uh, God spoke to my heart. Well, I'm, I'm, a, lot, a lot has happened to me, and I want to share this with you because you've been part of this journey with me. I got my, I got my certificate when I graduated from cardiac rehab, and I got a red bottle, of, if that's for your heart health. Uh, first thing I did is I dropped it and bro broke it. I was at the gym, at least I was where I was supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> but God has used my, my health my heart to help others. So when I graduated from class, I said to my the head instructor, I said, you know, there's, there's something missing here. Well, I have to jump back another half a page as well. Uh, I received an award some months ago that I'm still today incredibly humbled about. Uh, and I was, in, I was two weeks to finishing my cardiac rehab class and it was all over the newspaper. And I was even more embarrassed by that. But prior to that in my cardiac rehab class, I was just Joe. I was just another member of the class. I liked that, just being Joe. Uh, and then I caught the class that morning, and two men came up to me. So you're a chaplain? And I lost my identity as Joe, and then I became their chaplain. I became the God guy. So when I finished the class, what spoke to me was that all of these men and one woman in my class almost or could have died. And they were wrestling with 
life and death. And they were left, in, left with the, I almost, but I didn't. And the question, well, and now what? So God spoke into my heart and said, and they used to have at L&M, they used to have another course after, a class after this one where people could sit and converse about their experience. Well, they canceled it because of COVID. COVID took a lot from us as, as, a, as a people in every community across the world. So God put it on my heart because I just got stupid on my forehead all the time that maybe I should just put one together. So I did. I presented it to the senior center of my community and the assistant director said, this is a really good idea, chaplain. Uh, you'll facilitate it, right? Okay. Then they submitted it to Yale. They thought, really good idea. Now my cardiologist said, we'll refer patients over to your class. I'm thinking, what did I, what did you, what and why? But see, through my heart attack, my heart event, God has opened up the doors to help others. And as we'll see as we proceed in the next couple of weeks, how Paul's life changed on a given instant. He wasn't looking for it. He was very content being Saul, the Pharisee. Powerful, rich, wealthy. Another little tidbit about his past. His mom died when he was nine. And, and I wonder, for anyone that has, has, or knows, we all do know, uh, what it's like being a single parent. And Saul lost his mother, and we know how important moms are in the lives of their children. Saul was only nine. So I don't know, because I can't, or I haven't found it yet, how his mother's death affected him and his growth. See, it's an interesting thing when you start looking back at people and you want to turn a layer to find out, well, here's how you are over here, but all over here. How, what was Paul's journey like? And we're going to explore that in the next couple of weeks. Because the Apostle Paul that we know wasn't the, wasn't the Saul that we knew. He, he was very different. But was the very different part of him is what molded him into the man that God wanted him to be. Ananias, as we talked about earlier, now can you imagine, you're in a great relationship with God, Jesus, and God says to you, I want you to bless this man that's persecuting my people. You want me to do what to who? God doesn't give us options when he calls us to serve him. I, I, I'm now teaching this class, and I had a gentleman come up to me at the end of the first. I was, I was, we had no way of knowing if anyone would come. Well, that's okay. You know, when God says if two or more are gathered, I only needed one other person besides myself, and I was a winner. <laughs> the class was a success. But we had five, and it blew me away. I'm still kind of in awe of it. And a gentleman came up to me with so, well, this is so funny. It's in the town of Waterford. That's where I grew up. That's where I live. So the gentleman that comes up to me after, he says, you don't remember me, do you? I, there's a lot that I don't remember at 76. I might even forget your name in a minute if you turn away from me. He said, we went to high school together. The last time I saw you was in 1966. And I thought, wow, we had a pretty big class, so, wow. And he was so moved by, because I'm, I'm the God guy, you know, so I, I in this cardiac rehab class, the, it's all, Jesus is all through it. And I, the interesting part where God is part of the waters there, when the assistant director, when I, kind of, I said, well, you know, I had a very, I said, I'm a Christian, as you know, I'm, your I'm the town chaplain, if you will, police chaplain. And I pray a lot in town. She said, yeah, yeah, we know. Uh, uh, that's the, one of the things that has happened in our community. The chaplaincy is changing it, our town in many ways because our leadership likes Jesus, and they like to pray, so I get to pray at every event in town, and it's, it's a pretty glorious thing to, to share God uh, to everyone that I know. So I've incorporated that in my little curriculum on, for people to get well, and that's faith. So this gentleman walks up to me, his name is Brian, and he said, you know, it's, it's nice to see you again. He said, this was awesome. I've had this just burning inside of me, questions about why. 
And, and he said, this is a place that we can just talk and it's safe. That's the important thing, it's safe. I said, it is safe, you can share whatever you want. Then he says to me, but by, by chance, um, and he, gets, he goes a little closer, he says, have you had prostate cancer? And, I, and, I, and I'm about this far, no. <laughs> Because I, I know of a group of guys that, that you know, they, they're recovering from prostate cancer and they need to talk about it. I said, okay. Um, I, I'm kind of at a loss for words, which is hard for me. Um, I said, okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> so one of, my, one of the people in my medical arsenal of people, I mentioned it to her and she said, I know of a group. So when I see Brian next week, when we have our class again, I've got a group for him to go to. See, there's something about worship that we often don't think about. It brings us together for a common interest, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The unity of the church is of paramount importance. And God uses us all in his own way, through all of our trials, for his glory. Our success belongs to him. So as we look again in the next couple of weeks, I'll wrap things up here. We're going to see more about Saul and who he was and how his environment around him molded him. But in spite of all that he appeared to be, he wasn't the man that God would have him be. You know, we make plans, and I've done that a lot. In fact, in writing some of my sermons, I got an idea. And I get eight or ten hours into it, and God goes, now nah, let's do something new. And I go, what? I'm, I'm getting to read some incredible books and some, from and some incredible authors and pastors. Um, I'm going to again quote, and I'll probably do this at the end of every, every lesson uh, for the next couple of weeks. Because I've given you a little peek about who Saul was. He wasn't a very nice man. Murderous is the word that I can do. Reveling in, in, the, in the stoning death of Stephen and the harm to Christians. But yet, Charles Swindoll says this. A man of grace and grit. He was a sensitive man to the needs of others. I thought he was a murderer. He had, the, he had an affection for people. He demonstrated authenticity. And he was enthusiastically affirming. That was the Apostle Paul that he came to be, the Apostle Paul that we know. But next week, we're going to turn pages back again. And we're going to see who he was. And maybe through who he was, we can see what God saw in him. Because remember what a beautiful writer Paul is. Well, when you look, he's highly educated. You know, we don't often think of people of that time. We don't often think of education as we think of it today. But Saul was a highly educated young man, brilliant. And God used that later on in Saul's life to write the beautiful letters that he did. But I didn't know that. You know, I, I wanted to know, was there a dirty Paul? And there was but how that dirty Paul became the Apostle Paul is something for us to all behold. And within that, we see hope. We see hope. So again, I say, it's so good to see you all. <laughs> I get so much joy here. Uh, you are all so important to the kingdom of God. And, and, you know, with, I have a bunch of prayer buddies and we've been praying for you here. And uh, I didn't want to share the joy that Bob told me on the phone the other day that you, you had finally found a new pastor. Uh, God's timing is perfect. Uh, uh, you know, mine is the best guess at that. But I can't wait to share with my prayer partners that their prayers have been answered for you. Uh, we should never be short on prayers. And I met a new chaplain this morning. Very nice to meet you again. Uh, we are a unique breed. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the joy. 
We thank you for this church that is so filled with your spirit. I thank you for my dear friend, Pastor Gary, who served this church well, who loved these people well and long. We now open the doors to a new pastor and a new beginning, a new start for an old church with a new life. We ask you to continually bless her, uh, fill her with joy, fill her with voices of praise and song. You ask, we ask you, Father God, to extend your peace upon each person here and to this community that this church serves. We ask for your blessing on the new pastor and his family. May they be a beautiful light in this town of Basra and the entire area here, Father God. We thank you for every moment of existence in this church's life, what she has been and what she will be. We hold this day up to you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.